anyway. Bless you. Thank you. Um, our Old Testament reading was about Moses having to nail a bronze snake to the top of a pole. And Jesus, in our New Testament reading, says to Nicodemus, you see, it's like that, that the Son of Man has to be lifted up. And when he is, he can bring eternal life to all of us. Good, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Uh, can I tell you how healing works? I know this because I've been doing this full time for 25 years now, so I, I get in the feel for it. One, it's very simple, actually, and it's very difficult to do, but it's very simple to think about it. And it works like this. As our trust in the Lord comes up and meets grace coming down, it's where those two touch that the kingdom of God breaks out. promise you. I've seen it so many times. Thousands and thousands of times around the world. As your trust comes up and meets grace coming down, where those two things meet, the kingdom of God breaks out. Now there's nothing much you can do about the grace coming down, is there? Answer, no, Michael. No. Right? No. Because it's all organized. It's called the cross. It's Calvary. It's finished. The work is absolutely finished and done with. Yes? yes. There is a dirty great hole in the universe between heaven and earth caused by Jesus dying on the cross. Yes? yes. He, he was raised again through it. And that means that the grace that God has for us is flowing all the time. The problem is our trust. It's not as easy as you think. Although I know we only need a mustard seed, sure, but it's not always that easy. So I thought I'd give you two minutes, no, sorry, five hours, 105,000, is it? On, on trust, is that all right? I think that the, if you go back to Moses having to nail a bronze serpent on the top of a stick, um, it's the piece of scripture I call the snake on the stake. <laughs> and that is, is thousands of years before Christ, but it's a terrific symbol of the cross. Yes? Yeah. Because we know that two people got mortally wounded on the cross, Jesus and Satan. The difference being that Jesus came alive again. Right? And I picked that up because in, in actual fact, it, it, it's a great thing about trust because... Although they had been attacked by a lot of snakes, the children of Israel, when they were naughty in the wilderness, um, they did what we would do. They, they went to Moses and said, get God to get rid of the snakes, will you? Yeah? yeah? But God didn't mention it. He didn't get rid of the snakes at all. He didn't do it. What he said was, no, 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 no. Get a stick and get a bronze snake and nail it on the top and get the people to gaze at it. Yeah? And when they did, they got healed of snake bites. So it's obvious to me, folks, that, that actually gazing on the work of the cross is a terrifically healing thing to do. Yeah? yeah? So now we've got a rather interesting situation we can follow because in the ancient Hebrew that, that that book was written in, the bronze serpent is the same word used for the snake in the Garden of Eden. Okay? So if we go back to the Garden of Eden, you see a very interesting trick. This is the enemy, Satan, old Nick, whatever you call him, yeah? yeah? This is his original trick, and this is the big trick that he still works happily through the world today, yeah? This is the big strategy. Because Adam and Eve, you see, in the Garden of Eden were great friends with God, weren't they? I mean, they were born in his image. That means to say that they thought like he did, yes? And you, you meet somebody who thinks very much like you do about a lot of things, you become friends, don't you? Yeah. Okay, fine. So they, they were great friends, and they used to go off every evening, didn't they, in the cool of the day, and go walkies with, with God at night, and chat over the things of the day, yeah? yeah. Great stuff. They were great friends. Along comes a snake. 
and starts to tempt Eve with the fruit. Yeah? yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I always pondered, why, why did he tempt Eve and not Adam? Mm-hmm. And I, th- I think I know the reason. I think that the trick here is that, you know, if, if you want to come down to hunt and shoot and fish in, it's we men that are the strongest sex, yeah? But if you want to come down to actually exercising influence in the world, you ladies are the strongest by miles, I do. Yeah? Yeah. And that's what Satan was trying to do. Yes? What influence? Well, that's the great trick. I don't tell you what, it works. Is that what he tried to do was to twist Eve's view of God. He tried to misplace it, just to shift it so that it's not strictly in focus. Hmm? He did it by getting her to concentrate on the fruit. What, what God had said was basically, don't do that or you'll, be in, you'll find yourself in a lot of difficulty. And the snake switched that round from the disobedience to the fruit. He said, no, 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 never, you never mind all that rubbish. Let's look at the fruit. Yeah? And the Bible says that when Eve saw the fruit, she thought it was tasty, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? So, and, and, well, trouble is, she says, God says we'll die. Get off, says the snake. You won't die. That's a silly thing to say. Yeah? Oh, well, the fruit looks good. How can you possibly that kill you? It looks absolutely gorgeous. So she has a go. The problem is not the fruit. It's the fact that she was disobedient. He got her. Right? He got her by twisting this, this lovely friendship that, that they had with God. Yes? Twisted it so that what they saw instead was God being a bit of a party pooper. Yeah? I mean, let's spoil that fun. No, you can't eat that fruit. I know it's juicy, yeah? And making up all sorts of reasons why you shouldn't and just being generally miserable and spoiling all the fun in the Garden of Eden, yeah? Yeah. That's the trick, right? Is actually to misshape our view of God. So Adam and Eve, as you know, they left the Garden of Eden, didn't they? Yes? Uh, as, uh, as, uh, came into a godless world so we have to live in, in this trough that we live in where we get problems and things all the time um, but our friend uh, uh, and they were left it's, it's rather interesting when you think in healing ministry is that actually the first person in the world to be disappointed with our relationship was actually God not us at all it was God that was disappointed because his friend had gone yeah his friend and his friend's wife had gone. And he went after them, looking for them. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Didn't he? And he did that for many, many years. And, and he's so keen to restore this friendship. So keen, yeah? To restore the friendship between us and God. Is that he actually made somebody a, a, a human being. Yeah? A human being which we call Jesus, to actually look exactly like God and behave exactly like God and show us exactly what God is like. It's almost as if Jesus, you know, if one of the word of God that he is, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, look, look, this is what God's like. He wants to be your friend, yeah? So much so that you, you can notice all sorts of things, like, like for example, he, Jesus healed everybody who came to him as we often say in these services. But he's just saying, this is what God's like. This is the sort of friendship that I want with you. Yeah? Yeah. And it's so easy, folks, to suffer from this twisting of the enemy. It's so easy. I mean, if you look in the New Testament, you'll find that Jesus had no problem whatsoever healing anybody of anything until he hit Nazareth. It's the only place where he had trouble, yeah? yeah? I mean, he was like preaching there on a Saturday afternoon, I suppose, Saturday morning, and uh, the, the, all the villagers were there, and they thought, gosh, this is good stuff. He's really pretty good. And somebody suddenly said, hang on a second, who does this guy think he is? I mean, he's only a carpenter's son. I mean, his family are here in the congregation. So don't think he's anything bigger and more special than that. And they weren't wrong, were they? Because he was a carpenter's son and his family, no doubt, was there in the congregation. But they missed it, didn't they? 
It was misunderstood, misplaced. They missed the fact that here actually was somebody so purely like God, you might as well say he is God. And he had come to show us how God wants to be such friends with us again. Yeah? And it, it's so easy to listen to Satan twisting these things the wrong way. I think it's something that you, I, I often think about actually later on when we get into the sort of week before Easter, you know, is that um, at Jesus' trial, if you remember, Pilate couldn't find much wrong with Jesus, could he? Although all the people were yelling and screaming, crucify him and all this stuff. And it was the habit in those days to set free somebody at that time who, who was a, 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 a criminal, yeah? And to set them free. And, and so Pilate, I think, oh, what should we do? So, so Pilate says, do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas? And they all shout, give us Barabbas. And it's interesting to see the same twist of, of, God's view, of the view of God going on. Because, of course, the, the children of Israel wanted a kingdom of God that would simply solve all their problems. Yeah? Never mind what God wants and it doesn't do. Let, let's let's get, get rid of the Romans. Let, let's run this by our own law. Yeah? A sort of Roman Brexit. Yeah? Let, let's, that's what they wanted. Um, and Barabbas would fit, fit the point exactly as far as they were concerned. Yes? Uh, because he was a, a, a zealot, he was a murderer, he was a thief. Sure, yeah. But what he was trying to do in, in, in being a leader of the zealots was actually to overthrow the Romans and get them out of there so they could run their own country. Hmm? It's an independence party, but, but a bit more violent, yeah. So they all shout, give us Barabbas, because that's the king that we want. That's the kingdom we want. That's their view. Do you see what I mean? That, that's their view of the kingdom. That's what it was all about. Where Jesus was here saying, no, 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 this, this is about a friendship being restored. Yes, basically. It's about a friendship being restored. And they're saying, no, it's not. It's about kicking out Romans. Give us Barabbas. What I want you to be interested in is that in even the name Barabbas, you see, is actually two words. It's Barabbas, which means the son of the father, which is exactly what we call Jesus. Awfully close, isn't it? And it's so simple to get these things muddled together. And I can try, I can spend another... 5,114 and a half hours trying to, that's because that's how much recording time I've got left. Yeah. I, I can try and persuade you to raise your trust in Jesus by deepening your knowledge of the real one. Yeah? By deepening your knowledge, not, not of the misplaced thing that the enemy is trying to give. One way it works in the church is absolutely fabulous, right? I mean, fabulous in the sense of dead clever, right? Is that what Satan has managed to do is to convince us all that God really doesn't get into healing. He's not terribly reliable, yeah? Um, not sure he would want such a personal relationship, a friendship with me that he would want to do anything about my problem, so we don't bother very much, yeah? So gets together in church like this, get togethers where we actually pray for healing and so on, are actually pretty rare, um, uh, unfairly, because we still have the spirit of Jesus with us, he's still alive, he's still walking the planet, looking at us saying, but God wants to be friends like they used to be. Yeah? God wants to bring you an abundant life because that's part of his giving as a friend. It's his friendship that he wants to be restored. And, and if we allow a misplaced view of an unreliable God, a God who we pray to because, well, you might as well, mightn't you? You've got nothing to lose sort of God. 
If you pray to a God like that, almost certainly it's too misplaced to have, make it work properly. And when it doesn't work properly, we all say, see, it doesn't work properly, and we don't bother much anymore. So it's, it's, what I want to do this morning is to try and help you, help us and me, because I just love talking about this, to actually get our trust rising back by looking at Jesus um, exactly as he is. Now the problem is, trust comes out of two places in you and me. It can come out of our brains and it can come out of our hearts. Yeah? Now I suggest to you that if you have a friend, have any of you got friends? Yeah, yeah, yeah there you go, actually. If you've got a friend, I bet you anything you like, you trust them out of your heart. I bet what you don't do is sit down every morning and work out why you like them, should you like them, should you not like them. If they said, would I go shopping, would they go off with the money and not come back, or would they not do it? I mean, do I trust them or don't I? Yes? I bet you don't. I bet you think, I'm just uh, my friend. Yeah? Because, and the difference is that you're not trying to do it out of your brain intellectually, you're doing it out of your heart. Yes? Now, the trouble is, I could try you. I could say to you, oh, gosh, I've lectured this so many times, I've lost count. Of how many times I could say to you, look, you must trust Jesus because he, he, he healed everybody who came to him and asked. He's, he is the, the, the power of God. He is the living word of God. He is a perfect reflection of God Almighty. Yes? I could tell you all this stuff, and, but if, if, if sitting amongst you is anybody with a slightly disturbed view, right, a, a misplaced view of Jesus, you could start arguing with me in your brain, couldn't you? And you could start saying, yeah, but I prayed for my sister six times and she died. Yes? So it can't be true what you're saying, and so on. Um, this sort of thing that goes on. That's because the brain is working against the brain. Yes? So can we just forget for a minute, well, for the rest of this service this morning, that you are very brainy people. <laughs> can we forget it and just go for the heart stuff? Yeah? Because I know that there, there wasn't in the Garden of Eden, the way God designed us to live was in a world where there wasn't any sickness, there wasn't any hardship, there wasn't any breaking up of relationships that caused so much pain and so on. There wasn't anything like that. He, as a friend, wanted us and designed us, actually. That's why it hurts, you know, because we're not supposed to be there. Hmm? We are designed to live in an abundant life with God as a great friend. And... We ran away from your ancestors, did not me? We ran away from God, didn't we? Out of the Garden of Eden. It's his disappointment. Echoes, really, through the heavenly realms. Because he, he even, as far as we travelled away from God, he sent Jesus after us. And Jesus came and said to us, basically, all his words and works are just saying, this is how God wants you to live. Yeah? in an abundance, without this pain, with him in friendship. A great friend. Yeah? Um, so much so that God knew that, in fact, you know, he had to kill off Jesus instead of us in order to get to us, to, 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 to punish us. So that's all out of the way and gone. Yes? So that God could get straight at us. And the whole thing works so perfectly that he was able to raise Jesus from the dead and get him back into heaven, yeah? And send us a spirit so that we can begin to get the mind of Christ. And the important thing about understanding the, the spirit and what, what the spirit's trying to do is that the nearer we get to being like God in the way we think, yeah, the easier it is to make friends. You try making friends with somebody where you think about completely different views. It's not that easy, is it? No, it's a lot easier if you meet somebody who's, who, who, who thinks like you do. So it's, it's very important that, that we realize that God is friend and he wants to be a friend. Yes? So when we pray with each other this morning, yeah, I, what I didn't want to do was to start debating with you theologically the pros and cons of should you trust or shouldn't you trust. Yeah? Because it's, it's a bit like 
you know, I remember when I was being brought up, the church always used to say to me, you must love God. Well, that's almost impossible, isn't it? I mean, how, can you say to so you, you must love so-and-so, you must like so-and-so. You, you can't love because you're told to. That's what I'm trying to say, can you? It, it's, it's a hard thing, that's right, you know. I, I, I don't love somebody because I've worked out it's good for me if I do, you know. It's something that comes out of here. And it's the same with trust, yes? I don't want to tell you to trust. I don't want to convince you this morning at all because it's just a mental exercise as far as I can say. What I want you to do, please, is to find some way to trust coming out of here because that's the real trust, the one that comes out of here, that when it goes up, the grace comes down and meets it. Yes? Because that one's a mental exercise. This is a relationship. And that's what God wants, what's in there. Not what's in there, yeah? And there's a trust comes up, and, and the grace is falling all the time anyway, so you don't have to bother about that. But as these two meet together, that's where the kingdom gets a bit of elbow room. Start growing, start moving, start leading people, yeah? So I, want, I wonder if you could do this. When we start to pray with each other, and, and, and when, when Diane gets that going, yes? When, when it's your turn, I wonder if you would do this for me. Would you, would you sit here and just appreciate, it's not difficult, appreciate the presence of God in this room? It's not difficult, yeah? When you've appreciated this, I, I know he's the Lord of the universe. I know he's the King of kings. But he's, and I know he's all-powerful, Yes? He can do anything. And I know he knows everything. Yes? So we don't have to go do any explanations about what you want healed or how you want it done. Yes? Uh, you, you don't have to. He knows it all. But if you can appreciate it, I think to, to switch from mind trust to heart trust is what I want you to do. Yeah? Just by doing this, could you say to him in your heart, yeah? Silently in your heart, could you just say to him, Hello, friend, bringing healing to. Yeah? And then what, what you say after the two is, is your business. Yeah? You, you might have a bad knee, but you might have a sister who's got cancer or anything. Yes? Yeah. Uh, in which case, you, you, you fill in the rest of it as much as you like. Yeah? But if you could just say, appreciate, one, appreciate the presence of the Lord here. And the second thing is just to say, hello, friend bringing healing to, yeah? And, and rest in the knowledge that he is actually standing in front of you. We even sung that, didn't we? The presence of the Lord is in this place. Actually standing in front of you, looking at you, and you're saying, hello, friend, bringing healing to, yeah? Me, bringing healing to my mum or whoever it is, yeah? And may that action bless you mightily as your trust comes out of your heart and reaches up into the descending grace. May that thought bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.